The Unshackled Waves, episode 184. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One up-and-coming alternative news website in Australia and a new rival for the Unshackled is Cauldron Pool. It is described as a politically and theologically conservative website, providing news and opinion on current events. Its founder and editor is Ben Davis, who, in addition to breaking the big cultural stories of the day, is also a talented political cartoonist. He doesn't make many appearances on camera, but has been kind enough to come on the show today and introduce himself to our audience. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Uh, we've chatted a lot uh, via uh, Messenger, but this is the first time I think we've had a face-to-face -face chat. So it, um, it is. it's it's about time, I think. Yes, good to meet you in person, almost. Yeah. <laughs> now, anyone who's uh, read uh, Cauldron Pool knows your views come from a deep philosophical foundation, obviously influenced uh, by your faith, uh, but when did your att attention turn to uh, politics and following current events? Yeah, good question. I guess I've always been sort of inclined towards debate and, um, you know, discussing like, big ideas and concepts like that, and largely it was limited to the uh, theological type uh, discussions, um, biblical interpretations and whatnot. I think it was around the, the uh, time of the same-sex marriage plebiscite that I started to broaden uh, that a little bit. And it, I, I, I blame Mark Powell at The Spectator, I guess, for that as well. I um, teamed up with him and uh, we did a lot of cartoons together um, uh, for his articles for The Spectator. So um, that sort of brought me into it a bit. Um, but it was also just engaging with people on the issue of same-sex marriage. And it was around that time that I realized uh, there was a lot of people who are readily, who are ready to accept um, an idea of morality that is defined by consensus, basically. Um, they're okay with whatever the 51% of people uh, determine is right or good or, or moral. Um, and, and I think that's when I started to realize there's just a real, a real lack of understanding uh, widely. Um, just, it, I think the, the plebiscite just brought that out, brought that to service. It's just that people, people didn't think through their reasons for why uh, the, the definition of marriage should change. And, I think that was evident just by the shallowness of the arguments, um, which were basically just reduced to hashtags and uh, bumper stickers, I think. They got through almost purely from that. Um, so yeah, I think that's basically where it started and that's where I, uh, where I began, yeah. Well, so it was only very recent that, that that's when you decided I, sh yeah. I need to get out there and affect change. Yeah, oh, really, it was kind of just venting. I, I started the website uh, with a series. Uh, it came from a series of posts I put on Facebook, uh, just titled uh, "What Happens After Same-Sex Marriage." Um, that's where it sort of began. What comes after same-sex marriage? Sorry, um, and it was just about twelve posts that I put on Facebook. Uh, detailing incidents from Canada, UK, USA, places where they had changed the definition of marriage and then the consequences that followed. Um, there was very little commentary. It was just matter of fact, here's what happens to these people. These are some of the consequences that we should think about. And so few people were willing to talk about these consequences, the things that were taking place in other parts of the world. So I, I created those posts and then I, and I then created the website and I put it there and it got quite a few shares, well, a few shares, more than I expected at the time anyway. Um, and it seemed to be something people appreciated, so I just added and added from there, basically. 
Now, I'm curious as someone who, oh, I'm an atheist now, that's pretty much how the, the way I was, I was raised, so I'm always mm. sort of curious, um, somebody like you, who um, faith is very important, how that came to be a big part of your life. Were, were you raised in a religious household? Did you have the same values back then? Uh, yes and no. Um... I would say my values today would be largely affected by uh, my worldview, which is obviously as a Christian informed by the Bible. I want my worldview and my values to be as in sync with the Bible as they can be. So I, I wouldn't say it's some sort of nostalgia back to my childhood um, uh, or anything like that. Um, oh, no, that's I not what I was getting at. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah keep going yeah so so there, there was the influence uh up a christian influence uh, growing up um but it wasn't until i was about in my 20s that i actually think i uh, understood what christianity was and i understood uh the christian faith now you've spoken about how cauldron pool uh, was created and it was sort of similar to how i started the unshackled my uh, the unshackled was started out of my frustration with, with yeah. trump derangement syndrome and obviously you just mentioned it was during the the marriage debate and you've become very successful in such a short space of time i think not even a, is it a, coming up to a year now of cauldron pool i think so yeah yeah i, I, I couldn't pick the date but yeah, yeah it was the end of yeah, last year. And you're already up to uh, 5,000 uh, likes, which is all organic. So that's a, that's a pretty uh, good a, good achievement from just a not, basic... Not giving Facebook any money. <laughs> basic, yeah, basic startup. Uh, so obviously they're, like, what, what you post is it's, uh, it interests a lot of people. So what's the sort of strategy of uh, do I... What do you decide that you want to uh, cover and how do you go, go about uh, promoting it? Uh, well, to be honest, it was, it was, it really kind of came from um, thinking what's, what's lacking out there? What's the website that I would like to see? What's the website that I would frequently visit? And what's the sort of content that I would actually find helpful? Um, so a lot of the posts are basically uh, they just basically boil down to what what would I personally want to see? And I, and I figured, look, if I'm wanting something, if I feel like, you know, there's not enough of this content out there, then maybe there's other people out there too. Um, so it, it does just come down to this is, this is something that would interest me. Maybe it will interest others. And some people have been interested by it too. So, <laughs> yeah. I think the key to your success is you've been very reactive. You've often beaten us to a, uh, a story. I'll, 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 notice, right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see something pop up on, on Cauldron Pool. I was like, damn, we should have, should, should have, should have gotten that first. So I think uh, the fact that uh, first thing in the morning you're covering uh, the uh, probably what is the, the main cultural issue of the day, I think that's, uh, that's probably why you've been able to make it so far. I I, did, I wasn't aware, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> they're, they're, they're really like through the whole website. I've managed to meet a lot of really great people, and um, I have a, a a really good group of friends who are continually sending me stuff, continually sending me uh, resources and news stories that pop up on their feed. So I can't take the credit for uh, everything on there. I, there's a there's a good little group of people who really help out. Uh, it's always good when you get uh, tips, uh, meaning that Absolutely. other people do your work for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, really. The majority of stuff is being sent from other people. And, um, yeah, it's really helpful. Now, I want to talk, uh, talk a bit about, uh, obviously, uh, we've established your, your views. Uh, I, I wanted to go through probably what, what are some of the realities of the, the, the modern world and how mm. obviously the, the the way that you um, believe the world should be clashes with that and one of the big changes that we've seen over the past uh, 50 60 years is what's termed the the permissive 
uh, culture, which is obviously we've seen uh, the uh, stigma uh, disappear around things such as premarital sex, uh, contraception, uh, homosexuality. There, there's not the, the sense of uh, social shame about sexual mores as there, there used to be. What, what would you mm. say your views are when reflecting on, on how things used to be during that time? I think, yeah, I think it's all kind of ironic how it is being fashioned and sold to um, our culture today that uh, this sort of idea of, you know, the free sex and and uh, no shame associated with these things that we once called uh, immorality, it's it's often branded as progressive. These are progressive ideas. Um, but uh, with the, with a greater awareness of uh, history and, and especially pre-Christian history, I think that there's a lot more in common there with uh, what the world was like prior to uh, the Christianization of the West. Um, there was that sort of free uh, sort of sex uh, mentality out there. And it was really Christianity that helped to uh, rein that in. Um, so it, it, it is today seen as a liberation from kind of Christianity and, uh, and what they'd consider oppressive norms. Um, but a lot of the time, there's very little talk about the um, the consequences of uh, breaking free from what these norm these oppressive norms, um, and there's very little interaction with why these ideas uh, flourished for the f in the first place and why they lasted for so long. Um, I think a lot of people view the Bible and the biblical idea of sexuality as uh, God's just out to ruin fun. Uh, if there's something fun, God's probably got a law against doing that. Um, that's not at all the biblical uh, answer. That's not what the Bible's presenting. Um, I mean, it was only the... I've got the stats here somewhere. It was only um, the... Uh, when was it? I think it was last year ABC put up a, an article just talking about the uh, alarming increase in... Uh, STDs due to just, what was it? It was uh, Kirby, in, uh, Kirby Institute reported the staggering 18, 18 and a half thousand cases of gonorrhea detected uh, in 2015, up from 8,300 in 2006. And they went on to say in just a decade, the number of cases for gonorrhea annually has uh, more than doubled syphilis cases have more than tripled chlamydia cases have increased by 43 percent i mean these things these are just little instances that we're looking at and really it just goes to show that there isn't it's not just about ruining people's fun but behind the the biblical idea of uh sexuality there are uh, there are consequences and there are those uh, you know things that god is trying to prevent us from doing and uh, trying to like prevent us from, you know, spreading and having and, and whatnot. Um, that, yeah, so I think a lot of the reason for it is, is, is the worldview that people have these days, which is a very animalistic sort of understanding of human humanity and human nature. Um, people don't see anything wrong with having multiple partners because they don't have a view of uh, morality consistent um, or a, a view of morality that would hold them accountable for their actions either so and obviously another change that we've seen uh, recently is the decline of uh, Christianity. I mean, just looking at the, the 2016 census versus the 2011 uh, census, uh, no religion uh, was up to 30%, yeah. uh, up from 22.3% of the population, and Christianity was 52% uh, down from 61.1%. Uh, uh, what's, uh, what's your uh, way to address this decline? It, it's not a lot it's not as alarming for me um, in that I'm aware of the fact that Christianity throughout you know the 2000 years it's been on this earth there have been declines and there have been revivals and neither of these have been permanent there, there have been revivals 
uh, in the past where uh, mass amounts of people have turned to Christ. And there have been times in the past when mass amounts of people have turned away. Um, that's just the way that it goes. Um, it doesn't concern me too much. I, was, I think it was Rodney Stark who said the world um, today is, is far, far more religious than it was 50 years ago. Um, so, it, yeah, it's not alarming for me. I'm not afraid of you know, Christianity losing something. Um, I think the church could be doing a better job at uh, reaching out and making their, their, their message clearer to people. I don't, I don't know if they did the best job during the plebiscite to articulate their points. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's, it's yeah, not, a, not a, an alarming thing for me. What a lot of people would say is the cause of it is obviously the uh, loss of trust in the, the Christian uh, institutions, which obviously yeah. the, the big one is the, the, the sexual abuse uh, we, uh, scandals that's happened in various churches and which we had the, uh, the Royal Commission on. And I do understand uh, that there, a lot of this comes from people who are out to get the church and, and um, you know, have an agenda there, but it cannot be denied that there are a lot of uh, lifelong victims uh, of uh, these institutions and, and cover-up, and that's mm. certainly uh, something that uh, Christianity is still struggling to recover from. Sure, sure, but but in in any of these sort of instances, it's it's not so much a question of of what have people who claim to belong to the church done, but what does Christianity actually teach? What does Jesus actually teach? What's his view of uh, abuse and this kind of abuse? It is not at all consistent with Christianity. There's nothing in the Bible that would condone it, that would condone the covering up of it. Uh, much the opposite, in fact. That would, it, these people are, who, who commit these acts are outside of Christianity entirely. And the Bible's not unaware of the fact that there will be people in the church who claim to belong to Christianity, but actually aren't there for the right reasons, don't know Christ, don't know God. That's completely consistent with the Christian worldview. So the idea that because there are bad people within the church, therefore the church uh, can't be trusted or Christianity can't be trusted, it, it's what the Bible warns about and it's completely consistent with Christianity and it's something that Christians um, are fighting against. Yeah, that was a good response. They should put you in charge of uh, their PR. <laughs> I don't know about that. A bit more damage. <laughs> now, I, I, you mentioned that the thing that uh, got you involved in all of this was the, the same-sex marriage uh, plebiscite. Um, yeah. Despite the fact that the, the No campaign, I mean, it was, it was mobilized very well. It had a lot of passionate people, but... It was, yeah, by electoral standards, uh, a landslide win for the, the yes side mm. with 61.6% uh, uh, yes responses, 38.4% no responses, uh, a 3 million uh, vote uh, margin, and yeah. the, the response to, uh, to the no, no campaign from a lot of the media was that, um, you know, you're on the the losing side of history. Look how how much you uh, you lost by you. You really need to rethink your your outlook. Really, I would I would I looked at it, and the way that I looked at it was uh, that it was also in a sense a loss for Australia uh, and a loss for the people. I think when you really looked at the arguments for changing the definition of marriage. Uh, as I said before, there just wasn't any substance there. I mean, I, I hadn't had any conversations with people that uh, were meaningful in any sense. I, it, it was, it basically boiled down to these people deserve equality and it's love and who, who are we to say what is and isn't love? Love is love. But anytime I pushed them and I said, okay, if you want to take the line that says marriage is limited to the union of a man and a woman and you want to then include the union of people of the same sex a same sex couple on what basis then do you have for not including the same sex throuple or the or the 
they don't even need to be same sex at all. But if you're willing to move the, the line based on gender, why not move the line based on number? What's the actual moral reason for allowing one and denying the other? And really, when people said equality for all, they didn't mean equality for all, because I never met anyone who said we should allow polygamy. But if they want equality for all, that's what they mean. Uh, the argument probably wouldn't work on me, because I'm <laughs> very libertarian on these things. So. <laughs> no, 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 I, yeah, I understand that. I understand that. And I did, I have heard a lot of people say the government should just completely stay out of marriage. It's, it's, yeah. and, and, then, and I, I was in the, in the opinion as well that, you know, maybe it's better if they do entirely just drop out and they do, um, they don't try and define any, uh, form of marriage. Yeah, well, and certainly that uh, uh, that type of argument it does highlight the 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 inconsistencies yeah. uh, there. Absolutely, absolutely did, and not only that, but as I was saying before, it does show a shift from um, an idea of absolute morality to moral relativism, which I think is a disastrous thing. I wrote an article once for the Spectator. I think it was called. Um, uh, what was it? It was along the lines of the uh, change, uh, uh, a country guided by the moral fashion of the day, something along those lines. And it basically outlined how moral relativism, sorry, moral relativism, basically in any situation, anything is actually permissible, provided the uh, requirement is met, the 51% vote, whatever it is, moral relativism means there is not anything out there that is inherently in and of itself evil. And that's a scary thing for a nation to embrace. Um, I quoted Peter Kreeft in it, who said, no nation has ever embraced moral relativism and survived. And uh, I think C.S. Lewis, I quoted as well, who said moral relativism is, is the end of a species. Once they embrace that, it, it can't survive because it's a, it's a ship without a rudder. It's got no compass, it's got no guidance, um, and that was really the major issue for me, and still is, just uh, this, the, the idea that we make up our own morality, it's very troubling, and it should trouble everybody. Well, let's stay on the, the issue of absolute uh, morality. Now, obviously, the, the criticism that's levied at, at people such as yourself, and we'll stick with, obviously, mm. uh, same-sex marriage, it's part of what's known as the, the LGBT movement. Mm. And yeah. uh, like the argument is that these days, like surely, you know, if people, you know, are like gay or transgender, like that's a, a choice that re should be respected. Obviously, somebody like you is, you know, not going to agree that that's an acceptable lifestyle, but there, there, there's a certain argument that, well, at least if they, if that's what they decide to do, there shouldn't be this consistent media campaign against them. The articles that you put out, uh, do you, you don't feel at all that you're attacking people's lifestyles? Um, it would be more so in response to their the worldview that they're putting forward. Um, whether it is, and, and I don't think it's all uh, gay people anyways, there's, there's gay people on uh, my site who comment, like, and, and, and message us, um, and who, there were plenty actually, who actually were opposed to the redefinition of marriage in Australia. They just were never given a voice. They were never allowed to speak. Uh, no one wanted to hear from them. Um, so it's not about, uh, these people who want to live a particular way and we're just heaping, uh, crap on them. Basically, it's not about that. It's about when they're when they're pushing an ideology that's either inconsistent or an ideology that threatens other people's freedoms um, or just a worldview that that isn't sustainable or uh, contradicts Christianity, then I think we have an obligation to to question that and, and push back. And, you know, if I, I've got friends who are gay, I, I, I'm not ruining their lives. Um, there's, I don't think there's anything there um, that we've done or said that uh, could be uh, accused of, of doing anything like that. But, um, but when it comes to p 
people who disregard the Bible, disregard God, but want to turn around and start talking about right and wrong and uh, in terms of uh, universal, uh, absolute morals, moral standards that we're somehow violating, um, I think we have an obligation intellectually to call them their inconsistency on that. There was a um, professor from Monash University, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she basically celebrated the fact that Australia chose to redefine marriage. She had this sort of cultural morality, mor uh, just this cultural relativism that, you know, right and wrong are defined by what majority people voting say, but then condemned other countries and other cultures for their views on homosexuality. That's completely inconsistent. She, by definition, she has no grounds to object to uh, people in the Middle East throwing homosexuals off buildings. Now I can, my worldview can. My worldview can look at that and say, that's evil. That's really wrong. But a, a cultural relativist and everybody who voted yes for the same sex marriage has no grounds for arguing against that. Because if their culture, their 51% determines that that's right and that's good, how can we then impose our culture on them? What they're really appealing to is a moral standard that is above culture, but they're not verbalizing it. And if you ask them, the moral standard that they're applying to other cultures is themselves. They're their own gods. I'm not sure everyone who, who voted yes would agree with the outcome just because it was uh, fifty one uh, percent I, I mean that, that that type of argument it doesn't that it doesn't invalidate everyone else's uh, view who who voted yes what do you mean by that sorry oh well I'm saying that the that the idea was that marriage is a right uh, this is what they said and so the yeah. fact that fifty one percent voted for it. I di uh, f it didn't in didn't affirm that it was a right. It was already a right. So I don't think that they're saying that. Oh, because uh, fifty one percent said so, we accept that, and the fifty one percent over in another country can accept that. Yeah. Well, really, in order to redefine marriage, marriage was defined by Jesus as the union of a man and a woman um, for life. That's Jesus's definition, which was uh, he, he took directly from Genesis 2. In order for someone to come along and say, no, he's wrong, I'm going to uh, say that we should change that definition. You've got to appeal to another standard uh, of right and wrong. And when it came to the, to the marriage, uh, to redefining marriage, people were appealing to another standard, which is why they said love is love. If I came up and I said, love is love, but they don't deserve it, or they're not good enough, or whatever reason I, I gave, and they responded by saying, no, that's wrong. They're obviously appealing to some moral standard, at least ethical standard that says these people should uh, be allowed to change the definition of marriage. That's where the inconsistency was, that once they disregard a higher standard, a uh, divine standard of uh, right and wrong and, and what marriage is and isn't, they're only left to embrace their own personal opinion or the opinion of the 51%. Yeah, I understand your argument there. I just thought it was when you were talking about the uh, the majority opinion in the Middle East, I just thought that yeah. was a poor example. Yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't know what uh, you meant, so. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, the other thing I wanted to raise with you is, uh, is that there can be with uh, devout Christians, a lot of hostility between t uh, 
between them and people of other faiths and no faiths. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, Christian and, and atheists arguments, some of it quite vicious, and yes, atheists are guilty of, uh, of doing that as well. And it's going to be the, the fact of our society, our world, that people are always going to uh, to disagree. And yeah. you talked about that when uh, you, uh, there's there's people who are putting down your your worldview or uh, ridiculing your values, you yeah. have a ha have an obligation to defend it there. But where do you see the? I mean, like obviously you're talking to. Uh, an atheist now, so so you do uh, do there's a certain level of um, respect uh, between us. But where 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 do you think that uh, where do you sort of feel that there's sort of the how is is respect earned between differences? Um, it's yeah, this is difficult because every single person is going to bring um, some sort of bias to the debate. Um, I think when it reduces to uh, pettiness and dodging, dodging an actual argument uh, and you know, ad hominem attacks and, and whatnot, things like that, it's, it's very hard to get through. Um, but keeping it as rational as possible and as clear as possible, I think healthy debate's good. I think um, people can you know, clash heads on things and argue about things, and I think it's useful. I think. Our culture is just so sensitive these days and everybody's so easily offended that you can't tell someone that you think they're wrong without being afraid that their 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 feelings are going to be hurt by it. Um, it's absolutely fine to be to have somebody think you're wrong. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm maybe I'm a bit too blunt at times, but um, I think it's healthy. I think I think. Uh, People usually come into a debate and leave uh, the way they came in, uh, maybe a bit more angry, but uh, you never know what people think about later on. Probably the, the belief in Christianity, which probably causes the, the most friction with uh, non-believers, is that of uh, uh, creationism, just because there there is uh, a lot of... Um, well, there, there's been a lot of scientific evidence presented uh, to uh, t for evolution, uh, obviously they've found uh, fossils from uh, since the beginning of time, which show human uh, evolution. And there's a there's a, there's a lot of uh, Christians who say that uh, we should abandon uh, this type of belief, and uh, it does uh, put a lot of people. They they think that that's uh, in this modern era. That's just an absurd uh, position to to put forward. I mean. Do you think it's still worth advocating for? Absolutely, I do. I think the I think there's this false idea out there that when it comes to science, you've got science in one corner and you've got faith and Christianity in the other. That's completely false. I think that was created to just discredit Christianity and, and, and to say these are science denying people who are just wishful thinkers. Uh, so it doesn't matter what uh, science you present to them, they're not going to buy it, they're going to disregard the science, and they're going to hold to their fairy tales. That's basically the way it's presented uh, quite widely, I think, these days. The question, well, the fact of the matter is, no one's throwing away evidences. You've got the creation scientists, and it's not they're not even necessarily Christian. There are plenty of non-Christians who, who can see that uh, there's more to this than, than uh, atheistic evolution would suggest. Um, everybody's dealing with the same facts. What, where they differ is not in what they're dealing with, but how they're interpreting the facts that they're given. If you're given a set of facts and, and you examine that with the presupposition that there is no God, you're going to interpret those facts. You're going to interpret that evidence a particular way. If you get that same evidence and you interpret it with the presupposition that there is a God, that Genesis 1 explains uh, the origin and creation of the universe, then you're going to interpret that differently. It's really a, de a debate about what presuppositions do we have that is governing how we are interpreting uh, the evidence in front of us. 
Now, obviously, one thing that both you and I are united upon is opposing the the agenda uh, of the left, and, and just because it, it it is becoming so totalitarian, there's constant cries of, of bigotry. The uh, some of the most absurd one uh, uh, cultural appropriation. I mean, that for example, that girl who was shamed for a white girl uh, for wearing a uh, a Chinese dress to her prom. And there's yeah. th uh, th uh, then there's these absurd things happening uh, happening in Hollywood that uh, f uh, gay uh, parts in in films have to be played by gay people, or you have yeah. to be uh, gay enough. And th yeah. th 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 there's just this insane standard that even if you you do submit to their their world view, there's an ever higher higher standard, uh, and mm. uh, uh, before ba basically you've got to basically uh tiptoeing around making sure that you you don't offend anyone yeah it's the uh the outrage culture and what it what it really does is it excuses people from having to actually engage in argument and debate i mean we all know racism is bad and anyone who approaches you and is blatantly racist, genuinely, everybody's racist these days, but I mean genuinely racist comments. You don't really need to go into an argument about here's why racism is bad. You can just basically say you're a racist and brush them off. And they've kind of just reduced every sort of opponent to that level. If we just brush them off as a racist, everybody knows racism is bad. So we don't need to engage with their arguments. We don't need to reason with them. We don't need to think about what they're saying and respond to what they're saying. We can just brush them off as a racist. We can brush them off as a uh, homophobe, sexist, transphobe, whatever, every phobe you can imagine. And then we don't need to engage with their actual argument. And I think it's just a, it's just an infantile sort of response to, I don't know how to deal with this person. I don't know how to deal with what they're saying. Uh, how does a child react? Throw, t throw tantrums, throw punches, and that's basically what the left do. And they also have, no matter how much evidence is presented, that the left have an inability to see facts. I mean, uh, just looking mm. at, nobody can deny that there's an unacceptable level of violence and sexual abuse in remote indigenous communities, but just that if you draw attention to uh, those facts and hey, uh, Aboriginal culture need, needs to change, you're uh, yeah. accused of uh, being a, being a colonizer, uh, okay. imposing uh, uh, white culture. Another example is uh, obviously what goes on in the, the UK with the, the Muslim grooming gangs and the fact yeah. that it, uh, the, the whole reason that got out of hand so much is because everyone was scared of being called racist and yet yeah. all these young girls suffered mm. it's 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 a shame it's i think because a lot of the just learning institutions these days have abandoned uh the practice of teaching people how to think and rather than teaching people how to think they've taught people what to think so they don't have the ability to step outside of the ideologies that have been given at universities. They're, they're kind of in this mental locked room uh, without a key and without a door. And here we are trying to get through to them. And it's just, it's a, you, you just can't break through. You just, it's very, very, very difficult, I think. And obviously, you and I were, were all too uh, familiar with the uh, twisting the the mainstream media uh, does with. Uh, well, that's why we're in the the alternative media because we uh, we want to put out the the real news. And uh, you know as much as I do. I mean, I go to cover public rallies all the time, and then I see what's put on the the six pm news, and it's totally not what happened mm. uh, but the, the the media clearly have an agenda that this is how we want to present uh an issue and it's it, it's completely fake and I, I know from experience that they don't do their homework at all it's much like the uh the universities they've got a narrative they've got an ideology that they're pushing and they're going to dictate what that is and regardless of what, what the situation was they're going to present it in a certain way. And I think we saw that perfectly. For those people who are familiar with 
uh, Lauren Southern and Stephen Molyneux, who are familiar with the content of their, you know, their presentations. And you just saw the blatant lies throughout the media. They were just utterly committed to presenting these guys as Nazis. Yeah, and far racist. right is what they like to call them. And and I not once, not once did I see either of them quoted ever. I I don't know. I don't know if there's an article out there that cited anything that they said as uh, evidence for their racism, but they were just called every name under the sun because that was the narrative. That was that was how they were to be sold. My favourite uh, over just the past week was uh, Channel 9 News. They referred to Avi Yemedi as an extreme right ac activist. I, I hadn't see. heard that that for, <laughs> I don't uh, know which is term before. further right, far right or extreme right. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a new one. But <laughs> it's such a loaded term that uh, it speaks for itself. I, I like the uh, Lauren Solomon, the uh, racist fascist. <laughs> they couldn't spell fascist. <laughs> I think that was Channel 7. <laughs> uh, now, obviously something we both have to be aware of is making sure we don't uh, report fake news because there, there is a lot of uh, fake news out there. One of the, the worst offenders that, that I see, I see a lot of conservative friends share is Your Newswire, which is... Yeah. It's it's a well known yeah. fake news site, and it it obviously damages our credibility uh, so much. Yeah. But even uh, fake news can seep into uh, the uh, the right wing media. For example, there was there was a report I think it was in News Corp papers that that Thomas the Tank Engine books were going to be banned from from libraries, where it turned out yeah. to uh, just be uh, as stitching together a whole bunch of studies and concluding that that's what was going to happen. And a lot of us uh, were, were a bit too eager to be, be outraged and, and fell for it. And then the, the left was able yeah. to say, ha ha, you all got, you know, sucked into yeah. this fake story, which, which obviously, um, you know, d doesn't do us uh, any favors in the long term. Yes. Yeah. Well, as you said, like, it really comes down to verifying the stories and not taking them secondhand. It's, it, it's the basic story of Chinese whispers. I mean, the, the, the story will change the more years it goes through. So find, getting to the source of the actual story is ideal, I think, in, in every situation. Now, obviously, we're at a f interesting time in Australia, to say the least. We've just had a change of prime minister, but not much seems change to be... Change smoke alarm? Yeah. <laughs> I mean the the political. I mean Scott Morrison. Are you still committed to the the current uh, immigration uh, policy? He said that he doesn't want to withdraw from from Paris. It seems that the the big issues that conservatives wanted at least addressed and discussed about are are not not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I think this is this is what makes your website very different to mine. You, your uh, analysis on these issues is far greater than mine is, and I think you've covered this uh, quite well. Um, yeah, with the direction of where, where the government's going and, and what the future holds, this is an area that's beyond my uh, ability to predict. Um, what, yeah, what take, I didn't see Scott Morrison becoming prime minister, to be honest, That's that surprised me. Um, I thought Dutton would have that, uh, but yeah, what the future holds is beyond me at this point. I um, I remember a quote from Martin Luther who said, humanity is a lot like a uh, drunk man who falls off one side of the horse, gets on, then falls off the other. And I think we just continually see that in politics in Australia. It's one extreme to the other. Hard to predict. Yeah. Probably what we can predict or what or we can't see changing is the, the left's control of institutions will continue. And of course, we're, we're not just talking about so, universities, the arts and the media, but even big businesses, as we all found out during the, the marriage vote. I mean, they uh, have cool. uh, corporate social responsibility, which means they, they get on all of these uh, social uh, justice causes. And it's it, it just seems... Uh, uh, it's it's such a hard thing to to break, and and which is why why what we do is, is so important, 
trying to at least provide a counter to it and put out there that you know it's okay to think that this is this is not uh, not okay it and it does go to show the influence that they actually have as well i mean it was hard to find a business that didn't have the rainbow logo mm. on their profile picture um and just the power that that has to influence people uh and just how easy it is to sort of manipulate uh, the culture into thinking this is the trend now. This is what we're doing. This is what the the right side of history is about. But um, but like I said, it's far. They've got far more in common with the the other side of history, the pre-Christian era, than they do in uh, anything afterwards. And what are the the future uh, goals of Cauldron Pool? Obviously. As we mentioned, you've built up a substantial uh, following. I'm, I'm pretty confident you'll catch up to, to us uh, pretty soon in terms of uh, following, but obviously you know what the, the, the winning formula is. Uh, where do you see Cauldron Pool going? At this point, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I'm hoping someone comes in and says, hey, I'll buy it for $10 million. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but um, it's hard to say. I, I'm... I'm doing it, what I'm in, what I'm enjoying doing. Uh, people are benefiting from it. That's good. But uh, we're just out there to kind of give it, give another voice where I think there is not a voice. Um, I do think there is a there is a lack of uh, Christians engaging with these uh, cultural issues, and um, we're out there to argue that uh, Christianity is the most consistent uh, worldview. It it is the well, I would argue it's the only consistent worldview. And that it's the best response to um, what's going on in the culture, and that much of what's going on in the culture has come due to the rejection of the Christian worldview, and and we're seeing the negative consequences of disregarding uh, an absolute standard in morality, right and wrong, those things. Well, Ben, I've enjoyed our, our discussion tonight. We certainly uh, covered a lot, and, and surprisingly, we actually didn't go for, for, for too long. We are worried that this discussion might get out a bit out of hand. I thought so too, yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, it's been good. Yeah, and uh, we'll certainly uh, keep communicating and uh, keep a, a somewhat friendly rivalry alive, and uh, yeah, all the best, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. As always, I'd like to remind you about some exciting upcoming events occurring around the nation. Former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage is almost due in Australia, and he's visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. Tickets are still on sale and can be booked by going to nigellive.com.au. Also coming by year's end is the tour in Australia by internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness. He is being hosted by Penthouse Australia. You can book your place by going to gavinlive.com.au. Also, uh, another reminder that we can't bring you uh, all of this uh, news and other productions without your support, so please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled by going to patreon.com slash The Unshackled. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.